Throughout most of the 1800s, fashion was not at the forefront of American society. In the early to mid 1800s, clothes were primarily hand sewn by the women in the family. For the wealthy upper class citizens, tailors and seamstresses could make custom clothing as well, however this was not nearly as common. Women typically wore long dresses or long dome shaped skirts paired with a blouse. Sleeves were frequently long, especially later in the century, and they wore corsets underneath their clothes in order to enhance their figures and boost their posture. Around 1860, mechanization was introduced to the clothing industry, and the ready-to-wear clothing industry started to slowly grow. Additionally, due to the Civil War, a more accurate and uniform sizing system was developed for men's clothing, and this soon spread to women's clothing as well. This development was essential for the eventual widespread manufacturing of clothing. Though the mechanization of clothing production started to grow in the 1860s, it was not until the industrialization period that the entire clothing industry was manufactured in factories and textiles. The Industrial Revolution of the mid-19th century truly gave birth to the business that would become the fashion industry. With the introduction of the factory system came the invention of sewing machines that could weave materials like cotton at an unprecedented rate. This allowed for the mass production of garments that flooded the consumer market and people began buying clothes for style rather than simple utility. At the turn of the century, fashion would become a cultural symbol reflective of con contemporary life that would uniquely characterize each decade to come for the next 100 years. Women's fashion in the first decade of the 20th century was very similar to that of the 1800s. Women still wore elegant long dresses that were very modest with corsets underneath. Skirts maintained their bell shape, however evening dresses became short sleeve. In an effort to offset this, women wore long gloves that covered most of their arms. Towards the end of the decade, dressing began to loosen as skirts became narrower and waists became higher. During the 1910s, there was much less emphasis on the S-shaped figure created by corsets in the prior decade. As a result, women's clothing had a much softer silhouette. During the early 1910s, the empire waist rose to prominence. The empire waist was when the waistline of a dress fell just below the bust, then the skirt of the dress extended to the ankles, skimming the body. Fashion in the 1910s was disrupted by World War I when many women were forced to enter the workforce. Because clothes needed to be more practical, utilitarian clothing, including overalls and trousers, became acceptable for women to wear at work. For women who enlisted in the Marines, uniforms consisted of long skirts with either a jacket or a tunic on top. While fashion in the Roaring Twenties is commonly remembered as glamorous, realistically, clothing styles were becoming much simpler for women during the 20s. The style of dress changed drastically as waistlines dropped significantly and hemlines became shorter, oftentimes falling just below the knee. Many dresses were designed to be shapeless. Evening dresses were frequently embellished with beadwork, sparkles, and fringe, which became a symbol of the renowned flapper fashion. Additionally, early in the decade, many women had a short, bobbed hairstyle and often wore cloche hats, which became a staple of flapper fashion as well. During the 20s, sportswear also became more acceptable for women. Tennis was a very popular sport for women at the time, and many famous designers, including Coco Chanel, started making sportswear for women. By the end of the decade, women's sportswear consisted of knee-length, sleeveless, shift dresses. The fashion of the Roaring Twenties was very much indicative of the new sense of freedom gained by women during World War I. Women played an important role in the workforce during World War I, and they had just gained the right to vote, so they gained much more independence, which was mirrored by their drastic changes in fashion. After the Roaring Twenties, women's fashion returned to its conservative nature. Hemlines on evening dresses were lengthened and reached the ankle again. Also, waistlines were moved back up to their natural position. Much of the simplicity of the Twenties was carried into the Thirties. However, evening dresses started to hug women's natural curves and emphasize their, fe their feminine silhouettes again in the Thirties. Many evening dresses also had low backs and flared out at the bottom. Hollywood greatly influenced women's evening dresses as many women attempted to emulate the styles of their favorite actresses. One development in the 30s that greatly influenced fashion was the bias cut. The bias cut is when fabric is cut on a 45 degree angle against the weave of the fabric. This creates a fitted, body skimming garment that emphasizes women's curves. While evening dresses returned to ankle length, day dresses fell to the mid calf. Day dresses had clearly defined waists and came in various patterns, including plaid, polka dots, floral, and abstract patterns. The Great Depression did have some impact on fashion as people started to use cheap fabrics to recreate elegant and expensive designs from Paris. World War II began at the end of 1939 and had a large impact on the fashion of the 40s. 
men's and women's style alike became very utilitarian and garments could be bought using ration coupons. The style of the 40s was more simplified. Women's dresses had puffy, padded shoulders, a cinched waist, and a hem that fell right below the knee. Women also wore boxy suit jackets with rounded collars and matching skirts that came in a variety of prints like tweeds and plaids as well as bright colored fabrics. There was a clothes rationing in Europe and a severe lack of designs coming out of Paris because of the war. This made room for American designers to introduce simple and casual styles that became very trendy. Formerly popular materials like wool and silk were very limited by 1942, so revolutionary American designers turned to materials like denim, seersucker, and jerseys to fill that void and produce a new era of practical garments. At the conclusion of the war, the new look was introduced. It used more fabric in its designs because it was more readily available after the wartime rations ended. The new look silhouette had rounded shoulders, a cinched in waist, and most importantly, a long full skirt. The new look became very popular by the end of the 40s and this style prevailed into the early 50s. Fashion during the 50s was very much inspired by the return of soldiers from World War II. As all the soldiers were coming home, women were exiting the workforce and returning to their prior role as homemakers. As a result, men's fashion was becoming much more casual, whereas women's fashion became elegant and formal again to match their role in society. At the beginning of the decade, both evening and day dresses had full skirts and nipped in waists. One of the most iconic and typical clothing items from the 50s was the poodle skirt. Similar to the dresses of the time, poodle skirts were felt skirts that had nipped waists and were full skirts that fell to the mid-calf. They could have any type of embellishment and were paired with tight knitted twin sets. The cocktail dress was also introduced during the 50s. A mix between a daytime and evening dress, cocktail dresses fell to the mid-calf, however they had the embellishments of an evening gown. As the decade progressed, new designers such as Cristobal Balenciaga rose to prominence and created less structured clothing for women. Their clothing contrasted the highly structured new look that dominated the late 40s and early 50s. One of the new designs included a straight cut suit, which was a jacket that fell to the widest part of the hips and a mid-calf skirt. There were three main fashion trends that characterized women's wear in the 60s. The first was the continuation of the ladylike elegant style from the previous decade. First Lady Jackie Kennedy and actress Audrey Hepburn became icons of this feminine style, wearing boxy skirt suits, A-line skirts, gloves, pearls, and coordinating hats. However, the style shifted by the mid-1960s to be more youthful and appeal to a younger demographic. Mary Quant was the pioneer designer of this stylistic shift and her designs brought the mini skirt and mini dress to popular fashion. This shift in design also brought about the use of new materials such as acrylic, polyester, patent leather, and shiny PVC that were sought to be used in a playful and innovative way that would reflect the scientific progress brought on by the space age that characterized the decade. The cinched waist of the previous decades was replaced by sheath silhouettes without defined waists contributing to the youthful and freeing characteristics of this decade of design. A third aesthetic emerged at the end of the 60s that played into the hippie movement and emphasized street style. Items like suede, headbands, caftans, afghan coats, beads, and flowy full-length skirts were launched into popularity. People also took to wearing secondhand clothing rather than purchasing directly from a designer. Fashion in the beginning of the 70s was a continuation of many of the hippie styles in the 60s. In the 60s, handmade materials were incorporated into fashion by hippies as a way to reject popular fashion. However, during the 70s, major designers took inspiration from this and included crochet, patchwork, embroidery, and knitting in their collections. Additionally, the flowy, loose fit of hippie style clothing and the hippie patterns were also incorporated into more high-class flat fashion brands. For daytime clothes, many designers pulled inspiration from the past. The daytime dresses worn by women were known as prairie dresses, and they resembled both Victorian and hippie style clothing. Prairie dresses were mid-length pattern dresses with flounces. Evening wear in the 70s was very modern and was becoming increasingly glamorous. Inspired by disco, velvet, satin, and sequins were very popular for evening wear. At the beginning of the decade, mini dresses and hot pants, which were very short and tight shorts, were also popular. The shorter, less modest clothing was a direct consequence of women gaining more and more sexual freedom throughout the 60s and 70s. In addition to sexual freedom, women were gaining more freedom in general and becoming more active in the workforce. This caused them to start wearing clothing that provided them with more freedom as well, such as trousers and pants. Suits and trousers 
and trousers became acceptable clothing for both formal and workwear. Trousers came in all different patterns to make them more glamorous now that women could wear them outside of the house. The 80s are known for their big, bold, and powerful fashion. The beginning of the decade brought a fitness craze that saw women wearing athletic wear in their day-to-day -day lives. Designers used stretchy and breathable materials like jersey and lycra to produce garments that were form-fitting and accentuated women's silhouette, most notably the bodysuit. The romantic style of the 70s continued into the 80s with some new additions like puffed sleeves, oversized accessories, belts, and bows. Women began using their wardrobe as a statement of power, as many women were beginning to hold more powerful positions in the workplace. The padded shoulder became an iconic look in the 80s, which helped to build out a woman's stature. Additionally, women began wearing vibrant colors, bold accessories, and high heels with pointy toes. A preppier style of American clothing also emerged that utilized typically male styles like button downs, blazers, and hand knit sweaters to create a more elegant women's look. Princess Diana was also a fashion icon of the decade and her wedding dress along with her day-to-day -day style became inspiration for designers and consumers in America. In comparison to the decade that preceded it, the 90s were a decade of minimalist style. Bright, flashy clothing was replaced by plain t-shirts, sweaters, and jeans. By 1992, grunge had become overwhelmingly popular and brought about styles of flannel shirts, stonewashed jeans, and a darker color palette of browns, grays, maroons, dark greens, and black. Many people wore popular British shoes, Doc Martens, and leather boots became a staple piece. By 1995, punk and alternative styles had become a large influences in fashion bringing about all black clothing and skater shoes young women during the 90s still enjoyed a rather youthful style wearing crop tops spaghetti strap tank tops skirts, capri pants and high-waisted jeans the neon color scheme of the 80s continued into the youth fashion of the 90s but was then replaced by a softer color palette that featured coral lilac and turquoise yet another style of the 90s was embodied by pop star mc hammer who popularized parachute pants which featured baggy cotton a tapered leg and a drawstring waist. Overall, the 90s saw a wide variety of styles that emphasized, that emphasized comfort. The 2000s moved away from the minimalist style of the 90s as designers began to incorporate influences from the 60s, 70s, and 80s into their clothes in a more colorful way. Denim jackets, mini skirts, halter tops, belly shirts, low-rise jeans, and capris all contributed to a new, more feminine style than was typically seen in the 90s. In the early 2000s, leather skirts, shiny pants, and sparkly shoes became popular with the rise of the Y2K era, worn by stars like NSYNC members and Britney Spears. The tunic dress, often paired with a thin belt at the waist, long button-down shirts, and sweater dresses also became very popular by the mid-2000s. The ballet flat was the most popular choice of footwear, which accompanied the 1960s-inspired bohemian looks such as yoga pants, cowl neck shirts, peasant blouses, and dresses worn over jeans. The late 2000s saw many of the same styles, but also introduced more neon colors, geometric patterns, and light wash jeggings. The 2000s also began the rise of fast fashion, which has come to dominate the fashion industry today. Throughout most of American history, clothing production occurred domestically. However, beginning in the late 20th century, companies began to offshore clothing factories in order to cut costs. Since the, co since the costs of labor are much cheaper overseas, the cost of clothes has decreased significantly. However, this has caused Americans to begin buying significantly more clothes than they did before. As a result, the environment has suffered immensely. Since Americans are buying more clothes, they are wearing each item less, and clothes are quickly ending up in landfills. Additionally, the factories that produce these clothes are giving off large amounts of carbon dioxide, which contributes to global warming and climate change. The working conditions in these factories are also extremely dangerous. This was displayed in 2013 when Rana Plaza, a large building that housed many garment factories in Bangladesh, collapsed and killed 1,134 garment and rescue workers. The owners of the clothing companies that manufactured in Rana Plaza were aware that the building had structural damage, however, they still ordered their laborers to work in order to maximize profits for themselves. The lack of worker protections in the countries that are manufacturing American clothing makes the cost of labor cheaper, however, human rights are being violated in these fast fashion factories in order to support the American fashion industry. Fast fashion has revolutionized the speed at which which consumers can buy and receive new garments. However, fast fa however, factory workers overseas as well as the environment are suffering due to this new culture of fashion.